This week, we're in the second week of our message set called No Reason to Hide, Standing for Christ in a Collapsing Culture. And I couldn't be more excited to be talking about this one this week. It's like, couldn't be a better time. It's like we planned this out, which we do. We did plan it out because of where we're at with our national and international environments and where we're at in American society, where we're at with election season. This is going to be a good conversation. Quick caveat. Uh, Several weeks ago, I was playing tag with my 11-year-old daughter, and uh, she was beating me, and being, you know, not quite 40 yet, I thought, that's not okay to get beat by an 11-year-old fifth grade girl, and so I gave it everything I had, and I tore my calf muscle, and then this week, I re-injured it. So, I mean, I'm walking around, doing the best I can, but if you're looking at me like, why is he doing that? It's because uh, I'm an idiot. So, anyway, in 1960, John F. Kennedy ran to be the President of the United States of America, And do you know what the most controversial part of his presidential candidacy was? Some of you who were alive back then, you you know the answer to this. And it had nothing to do with his policies. It had nothing to do with him skipping interviews or anything like that. His age was not the issue. It wasn't his party affiliation. It was his Catholic faith. It turns out that Christian faith and even denomination was the single most important barrier to entry for an American president in 1960. It's almost hard to believe today. Even 15 years ago for Bush and Obama, expressing a personal faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior was a must to even be considered. And some of you, you can remember those famous videos where both of them did that. For Obama's first campaign to be president, his pastor was the single biggest issue. It turned out his pastor had some pretty extreme views and it almost derailed his presidency just 14 years ago. The only time McCain led was when the controversy about his pastor's sermons came to the forefront of an election. And that's just crazy to think about like the pastor's sermons of a presidential candidate even being like an issue. Our country had different perspectives, but a candidate's faith was paramount, paramount for both sides. Today, I think it's a good question to ask, what happened to the role of faith in Christ and his church in America? I mean, we've almost completely lost our voice in American society. In just 60 years, we went from having the commanding heights of culture and society and power to being a sort of mocked sidebar. What happened? What did Christians do to give up so much influence? Not just in politics, but in life and families and society in general. How did we go from a generally united perspective as a country to a polarized, angry minority? And today... I have a great answer. And it's not just for Christians. The answer, I think, is key to breaking down walls, lowering the extremes of polarization. If you want to deal with some of the anxiety and and high temperatures that you feel in conversations, if you want to be able to have comfortable conversations with people that you disagree with, if you want to be able to win friends and influence people, and as a Christian, if you want to stand for Christ, in a collapsing culture, you're going to want to lean into this message set. No matter where you're at, it's going to be super helpful. And my structure today is just super classic. We're going to tell a story, look at some Bible, and make three points. That's very simple. But I want to start with the story. About 10 years ago, just before I moved here, um, I had a moment where I realized that my kids are just helpless. Have you ever had that moment where it's like, man, you guys really are... I didn't realize how helpless children were until I had some of my own. But this is my daughter Isabel uh, 10 years ago, right after we moved here. What a cute little chicken nugget. She had dazzling blue eyes, a heart of gold, and she had an iron, iron will. She was by far our most difficult little baby. And I remember watching her run around a friend's yard. She was running around the friend's yard. She's wearing uh, a, a Sophia the First princess dress. And there was one of these bushes that you have in Minnesota. We don't have them here in Indiana, but in Minnesota, we have these these, um, they're like burr bushes and they have burrs with barbs on the end of them that are the size of walnuts. They're really nasty, really bad, bad, bad trees. And I told my daughter, I said, Isabel, don't go by that tree or you'll get stuck. And I remember I could see the look on her face. She was like, dad, you have no idea what you're talking about, you know? And she immediately went for the tree. And she got stuck. And you know what? I remember watching her hair like held up in the tree. I remember watching her little tiara like hanging, dangling from her hair in the bush and whatever. And every time she moved, she got more stuck. Being the dad that I am, compassionate, loving, kind father, I let her squirm there for a little bit. Because I wanted her to experience the natural consequences of not listening to her father, right? She needs to learn. And eventually I got her out. 
And here's the thing, you know, she went straight for that thorn bush. She just wanted to run right by it and ran through it. And I knew that getting through it required a little bit of contorting, flexing, nuance, you know, navigating through. And I just, I thought to myself, she doesn't have the skill or emotional control or patience to navigate that bush, that tree. And had I not been there, had it been like actual woods where she'd be by herself, she would have died. That would have been it. Just a little tree taking her out. The tree was, was tough, too tough for a child to be near. She couldn't handle it. She couldn't handle navigating the nuance, of getting through those branches. An adult with patience and maturity and wisdom and restraint could get through it, could navigate the brambles, but Isabel is a child. She wasn't ready to handle it. So I, as her loving father, said, Izzy, don't go by that tree. And I think God in the Bible had a similar experience with us, his children. He had a tree in his yard in the Garden of Eden that was, it was too much for the kids to handle. And so as a loving father, he gave them a warning. It says in Genesis 2 and verse 15, the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of its fruit, you are sure to die. It was a different kind of tree. It required a level of maturity and restraint that he knew his kids couldn't handle. It had a different kind of sticker, thorn set in it. That knowledge of good and evil, it required a level of maturity and patience that humanity, God's children, did not have. The burrs and stickers were different. They trap and entangle God's children in a different way because they allow you to see good and evil. But navigating through that, man, it requires restraint. It requires patience. It requires judgment. And it can entangle us and trap us. You see, God knew that judgment would be tough for his children to handle and wield. He knew that we would get tangled up in one of two ways. We would either judge harshly and we would condemn, polarizing and hating and cutting off. Or we would not judge at all, enabling evil. And it's tough because, you know, these are kind of the extremes. And I think as humans, navigating in between these two is a little bit tough. It's tough to get in between those. We get stuck. We just want to run right through it, one side or the other. But God, who knows perfect love, is able to chart a course in the middle. And he calls it redemption or sometimes grace and truth. And it requires navigating in between. It requires restraint. It requires insight. It requires flexibility. Sometimes redemption has a little bit of gray in it. You know, condemnation, enabling evil, it's black and white. I mean, we just see it, it's easy. Redemption does not cut somebody off for being evil, condemning them forever. It doesn't enable and ignore evil, it fixes evil. It restores evil, it saves people from it. And that is what God does. He navigates in between condemnation and ignoring evil. It's a path of redemption. And we hate the in-between. As humans, we love black and white, Christian or non-Christian. We love just the black and white. This is what is good. This is what is bad. But redemption, ugh, it's awkward. It's not clear. It's unclear. It requires judgment and discernment. And this is the most important point of this whole talk. When it comes to knowing good and evil, don't hate it. Don't ignore it. Redeem it. We as humans, we don't like that third course. When it comes to standing for Christ in a collapsing culture, redemption just takes this incredible amount of personal maturity and restraint and insight and discernment and control. And when it comes to good and evil, I don't think a lot of us have that. Compared with little children on earth, of course we do, but compared to God, when it comes to handling good and evil, man, we throw fits. We need maturity. And God knew it. That's why he told Adam, don't go by that tree. It's gonna be real. You're not gonna be able to handle it. Redeeming evil is a big problem for people throughout the Bible. People are naturally incensed and polarized by it. Accept it or hate it, but that third path, that middle path of redeeming it, it's really hard, really hard. And this is the major tension that people feel with Jesus in the Bible. They see what he's doing. He's doing something that most people don't do. And I wanna look at a story today from Luke chapter 15. We're gonna exposit it verse by verse. You can turn in your Bibles there. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna teach from it, and then I'm gonna make three points from it. And in the story, Jesus encounters people that they're not good, they're bad. They do evil stuff. And rather than hating on it, rather than taking a stand, rather than ignoring it, Jesus redeems it. It's not something that we see very often in our society or in Jesus' day. 
we're going to unpack some of the most telling passages in the Bible. Jesus basically says, this is what my movement is going to be like. This is what my followers are going to be like. And he makes some pretty powerful statements in here for people who want to follow Christ. It's super rich. But I just want to give you a little background. So this is towards the end of Jesus's ministry, and he's leaving his kind of home base. It's called the Sea of Galilee in Israel, and he's traveling down towards Jerusalem. And somewhere, we know the story takes place somewhere in between the Sea of Galilee and Jerusalem. He's navigating down through here, and he's stopping by small towns on the way to Jerusalem where he'll be crucified. When he comes to these small towns, sort of like Demot, sort of like Hebron and Wheatfield, he encounters these longtime established society churches, synagogues. And they kind of have their own, they're set in their ways, you know, they have sort of a, a society that has been very established and, and they have tension with Jesus because, and here's why, Roman culture and Jewish culture, it's sort of like liberal and conservative culture today. And there's a huge culture war going on in Israel. Society super polarized to the point of violence. And the conservative Jews, they're like, you know, we need to take a stand against these evil Romans. We need to yell at them. We, we, we have to stop this. And some of the more, uh, the, the, the Roman sympathizers, the Jewish people who sympathize with Roman culture, they leave Jewish tradition and values and they help the Romans out because they see conservative Jews as hateful and mean. And to a certain extent, they're not wrong. And their culture is really polarized they just sort of stop talking to each other, a lot like today. I mean, we see it. And they're having a tough time with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They want to hate it or celebrate it. They want to just run straight through it. And they're getting stuck in it. They don't want to stop and navigate through it all. It requires contorting and changing and gray areas, and they don't like it at all. And that's where a story picks up. Luke chapter 15, verse 1. And I think this is really key to understanding Jesus. This is, this is like the key to the whole passage. It unlocks the whole thing. And so often we skip over stuff like this, but you have to understand the background. It says, tax collectors... Okay, so they're really bad people. Um, in the Bible, tax collectors, they, today it's like, we don't like the IRS. It's not like that. These are, these are really notorious, like mob bosses. They're bad dudes, okay? Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. And how remarkable is that sentence? These people came to Jesus to hear him teach by their own volition. It's amazing. Tax collectors hated conservative Jews. And it says they often came by their own volition to hear Jesus teach. They were not forced by their girlfriend. Their girlfriend wasn't like, hey, I'm going to break up with you unless you come to church with me. No. They were not coerced by their moms. They just came because that's how captivating Jesus really is. Question, do you live like that? I mean, if you are a Democrat, do you live that way? That Republicans want to listen to you or vice versa? If you are an atheist, do you live that way? where Christians often want to come hear you teach, listen, discuss? If you're a Christian, do you live in a way, do you talk in a way, do you conduct yourself in a way that non-Christians and agnostics want to come hear you teach? That is how Jesus lived, and it's kind of remarkable. I mean, for most of us today, the answer is no way. Would people that we really disagree with, we're not the kind of person they'd want to come listen to. The same is true for them back then. They either celebrated evil or they hated evil, but they didn't want to redeem it. And the Jews who saw Jesus hanging out with tax collectors, right? The conservatives, they saw Jesus hanging. They got upset. They got upset. It says in the next part, it says, this made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain. Made them mad. Who are the Pharisees and teachers of religious law? They're the people that they respected most. Imagine the people you respect most. You know, hey, mom, dad, I want to serve Jesus. I want to go into ministry. What? You don't want to do that. You're not going to make any money. They're upset, right? This made them mad and complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. And what it is, is the people on the one team seeing Jesus associating with people on the other team, and they get mad. Isn't that our society today? How dare you platform them? How dare you talk with them? We don't like people on the other side. When someone even associates with them, we get mad. We're like my daughter, stuck in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We see evil and we either hate it or celebrate it. We can't get through it. We're stuck in it. The idea of redeeming it is just so hard to us. It's really hard. The middle road, it requires balance, it requires contorting, it requires flexibility to get through that. And it often involves making both sides mad. What did Jesus do when he encountered evil? He didn't just sit with evil people 
and drink and party with them. What, what does the text say he did? It says he taught them, he taught them, he taught them in a way they could receive it. And they, out of their own volition, the Bible says, often came to be taught. And that to me is so convicting. It's amazing, it's inspiring. Do I live like that? Do you live like that? I mean, do we connect with people like that in that way? Usually, no. We get tangled up in the tree, stuck and dying, yelling at each other, killing each other, ignoring each other. But Jesus lives in such a way that the people he disagrees with the most want to hear what he has to say. And then the other people get mad at him. And he spends the rest of Luke chapter 15 talking to the other people, the conservative people, the traditional people, the churchy people. And it's interesting because throughout Jesus's ministry, he had no problem connecting with the people that you traditionally label sinners. They loved him. They connected with him. He was connected. It was the legalistic people, the pharisaical people, the ones who in our eyes are probably churchy. Those are the ones that really got mad at him. They're the ones that ultimately killed him. Luke 15, verse three, it says, so Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search for the one he has lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, I love this part, don't miss this. This is one of the most significant parts of the passage. It says, he will joyfully carry it home on his, where? On his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. And this is good, verse seven. I like this part too. It says, in the same way, there's more joy in heaven, more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. I'm talking about kingdom, what does the kingdom of God really value? It values seeing people far from God choosing to follow Jesus. I mean, that's it. That's the thing we celebrate most. Wow. Jesus is teaching about how to handle evil people. He says, look, they're not wolves to be shot or protect the flock from. They're not lame sheep to be put down. They're lost sheep to be rescued. And I think this is Jesus showing us how to handle the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The sheep represent people, obviously, all of them. And some of the sheep are mad at Jesus for leaving them to go find the lost one. The lost sheep represents a person who's fallen into evil. And instead of writing off that lost sheep, instead of going into the gully or ravine and saying, hey, here you are, you're fine, just where you're at. You know, you just stay there and I'll bring food to you. And when he doesn't enable him, what does he do? He finds it, he comforts it, and then he coaxes it onto his shoulders and he carries it back to the fold. And he says, this is the thing that we celebrate most. In my movement, among my people, this is the thing that makes heaven rejoice the most. You know, not just staying with the 99, but going and finding the one. And I find that really convicting. In a collapsing culture, it's serving God's kingdom, our minds corporately together should be about, hey, how can we go and find that lost sheep? And I think we're really bad at this, you know? I mean, I look at us as a culture and the idea of being able to, you know, earn the trust of, of a lost sheep, coax it onto our shoulders. It's like, man, I, I'm not, I wanna do that, but I can't, I don't. So I wanna spend the last part of this message looking at how Jesus did that. How did he coax that sheep onto his shoulders? I've got three points on it. And the first one is um, connect with the heart first. Connect with the heart first. You put that up, it's point. Connect with the heart first. Is computer frozen? Here we go, connect with the heart first. The disciples were constantly pushing Jesus to take a stand, you gotta take a stand. And Jesus, he always connected with the heart first before he took his stand. You can see him doing this throughout the gospels. In Acts chapter one, verse six, it says, so when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? What are they saying? They're saying, Jesus, when are you gonna seize political power? When are you gonna take a stand? We need a strong Christian in the White House, Jesus. And have you ever wondered, like, why doesn't God just take it by force? Why doesn't he just do it? I mean, why did he let people, why is he so subtle? Well, it's because Jesus knew that his kingdom, his movement, his church was gonna outlast Israel and Rome. Isn't that remarkable? I mean, he could have been the emperor of Rome, but he said, hey, I'm gonna establish a movement that's more powerful than the most powerful empire in the world. His church is more powerful than politics. And he knew that politics wouldn't change hearts, but God does. Jesus always focused on the heart behind the behavior before he addressed the behavior. He would address the behavior, he just connected first with the woman at the well, with Zacchaeus, the tax collector, with Peter, the temperamental cursing fisherman. He addressed the heart and then he addressed the behavior. 
When it comes to good and evil and redemption and rehabilitation, this is really hard to do. I mean, think about it in your own life. How often in your life, when you're frustrated with the behavior, do you take the time to connect with the heart first? Like imagine, you know, coming home from a funeral for your sister and your husband just left the house a huge mess, right? I mean, do you take the time to connect with the heart before you confront the behavior? In my wife's circumstance, that no, you know, let that be a lesson to you, Kristen. That's what Jesus did. When your kids are lazy and rebellious, when they're smarting off to you, do you connect with the heart before you address the behavior? You'd be a lot more effective if you did. When their politics are crazy and sometimes even evil, do you connect with the heart before you confront the behavior? The answer for all of us is sadly no, almost never. We go straight to the behavior. That's the human thing to do. And it's not very effective. You know, it doesn't last. I mean, if you really wanna change the behavior permanently for a long time, you gotta start with the heart and that's hard. It's really hard. So many of us, you know, who have employees that work for them, I mean, you need to do it this way. You gotta do it this way. And you know, they do it well for a week and then they stop. But if you wanna change for a long, you gotta connect with the heart first. We end up stuck in the burrs of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We know what good is. We know what evil is. We do, you just be good. How hard is it? How hard can it be? God connects with the heart first and he wins the trust to speak to the heart. Luke 15, one shows us, it says tax collectors, and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. Why did they come? Because Jesus connected with their heart. That's why. And if you wanna move the needle emotionally, politically, relationally, you gotta start with the heart spiritually. And a lot of you are like, okay, I mean, I'm convicted. Like I often confront the behavior before the heart. Uh, In fact, I have difficulty connecting with heart. I feel very unconnected to hearts in life. How do I do it? And the how is really simple. Build a relationship, a friendship with them first. Connect and listen. I wrote down, be winsome and captivating. You know, I think a lot of Christians, the question that we like to ask, and this is the question, the general area of questions that I get asked the most is, pastor, what is the right thing to do? What is the right thing to do? What am I doing the right thing? I wanna know the rules. You tell me the rules. And that's not a bad question. Christians should be asking that question. You know, another almost equally important question Christians should ask that we never ask is, am I a weirdo? (laughs) It's like, hey guys, when did we, like, why, do, why are we so weird sometimes? We give our life to Christ, it's like, yeah, now I'm just gonna just completely ignore socially normative behavior and be a weirdo. It's like, no, Jesus, he was actually connective. He was culturally relevant. He connected with people that did not follow his movement. And so often, that is just like an art that we stop putting effort into when we follow Christ. After winning the heart through relationship, then he confronts the behavior and calls him to change. This is what Jesus always does. I mean, when you read the Bible, you're gonna see this. He connects with the heart, then he calls him to change. He connects with the heart, then he calls them to change. And this is why Jesus changed the world. This is why Christians had the commanding heights of culture and society, because we connected with the heart. Then we address the behavior. Number two, be willing to leave the 99. Jesus told the story about leaving the 99 to get to the one. And it sounds great. Everybody wants to be that hero. Everybody's like, yeah, I want to leave the 99. I want to win a medal of honor. I want to do this heroic thing. But when it comes down to it, and what we don't mention is that leaving the 99 makes a 99 mad at you, right? I mean, that's just what happens in life. When you say, hey, mom, I want to go into ministry. She says, hey, why don't you be a doctor? You know, at least that's a Japanese thing to do. Why don't you play violin and the piano, okay? Um, When Jesus left the 99, what happened? It said, this made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. What do they do? They look at the lost sheep, and what do we all think? You know, deep in our heart, what do we think? It's like, well, they're evil. You know, they made bad choices. They made their bad. Now they got to sleep in it. They're toxic, malignant narcissists. And what about the flock, Jesus? Aren't you going to feed us? Aren't you going to take care of us? Oh, you got to take care of us. What about discipleship? I'm concerned about the deep, I'm concerned about these things. And Jesus says, hey, I'm gonna leave the 99 to get to the one. And, and, and he redeems the one, but he also pays a price to do it from the 99. I mean, who killed him? The 99, they killed him, they were mad at him. And sometimes in our life, if you wanna live a life of radical Christ following, you're gonna have to pay a price. Many of us are okay with yelling at evil, posting about evil, telling evil how evil it really is. Got to make sure we know. Got to take a stand, and that's fine. Or we ignore it. We pretend that, you know, I mean, I care, but I want to be loving and whatever, and we just ignore it, ignore it, ignore it. Live life 
never talking about being friends with somebody for years and never asking them who Jesus is to them. But associating with evil means we're gonna face friendly fire. And people on our side, the 99, they will be mad at you. And as a person, as a pastor, as a church, oh my goodness, do I understand that part. We deal with it all the time. Why do they do at the movies? I don't understand why they do at the movies and why does the church need to do that? Why do they gotta do trunk or treat? Because we're gonna leave the 99. Christians who left the 99, they redeemed Christmas, which used to be a pagan holiday. They redeemed Easter, which used to be a pagan holiday. Now people in our community, what do little kids think of Halloween as? It's a church holiday. We go to church, trunk or treat. I love it, we're redeeming it. Why do they do their sermons in a series? Why do they keep adding on? Why are they putting in a balcony? Why are they doing this? Why did, I heard they're doing another thing. I heard they got robots that are gonna be preaching now. They got robots up at Hebron preaching the message. They got a robot. I heard they got a hologram. Why they got so many services? They're just too big. Are they feeding the flock? Listen, shallow, easy, country club church and Christians hangs out with the 99 only, pleases the 99 until it becomes 98, 97, 96, 55, 44. We do messages that connect with the ones that are here. Listen, deep Christians, they live a life that gets the one. That's what we do, one person at a time. Now, that doesn't mean we can never hang out as a 99. We do all the time. That's a great thing. That's a good thing. But when one is lost, we get after it. It's what we do. And when we do, that's the biggest, most important thing to celebrate according to Jesus. And I think one of the big reasons Christianity lost the commanding heights of culture and society is because we stopped leaving the 99. Number three, call the one to redemption. This is big. I think the most powerful part of the second part of this passage is uh, here. It says, and when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. And that's a part of the passage that we look over, but it's pretty remarkable. I mean, think about this. Think about this imagery. Jesus coaxes this animal, builds trust with this animal at such a level, it will let him docilely carry it home on his shoulders. Standing standing for Christ in a collapsing culture requires us to connect with the heart first, then leave the 99, and then have that critical conversation. And when we navigate in that space, on the one side is, you know, angry, yelling, mean, and many people tend towards this. On the other side is enabling and ignoring. And enabling and ignoring evil, it destroys lives and societies, and many people tend toward that. But God, in his perfect wisdom and maturity, navigates the path in the middle, where he wins the heart of the sheep, coaxes it onto his shoulders, and then he carries it back into the fold. And this requires developing not gifts. Gifts are something you naturally have, but I think this requires developing skills. Skills are things that you just develop. You know, listening skills, persuasion skills, relational skills, and the biggest one to me is boldness. Boldness. You just have to have the courage to to ask. I think so many people, we never actually go for it. Some of you guys, you know, you've been hanging out with this girl forever, and you just got to ask, will you be my girlfriend? You know, it's like, come on, you just got to go for it. Sometimes when you're hanging out, who is Jesus? To you, you just have to ask, where are you with God? Will you come back to the fold with me? Will you come back to Jesus with me? A couple years ago, someone I really loved, was very close to me, um, left the fold. And they were not sure if they followed God anymore. And they sat at my table at the time. And the rest of my people were a little perplexed and irritated that suddenly we were so focused on knowing if God was real or not. Like we shifted the discussion to is God real? Where he came from and how did he get here? And the people at my table, they were a little irritated, you know, because we spent so much time pursuing this person and whatever else, but we did. Because we were resolved to stand for Christ in the collapsing culture of this person's heart. That's what we did as a family. You know, we were not gonna yell at the behavior. Instead, we connected with the heart first. We left the 99, and I didn't have 99, I had about five others at my table, but we left the five others to focus on the needs of this one who had left the fold in that moment. And when the time was right, after a few years of pursuit, we invited that person back into the fold and we carried them back to Christ on our shoulders. And today they love God more deeply than ever. And our whole household, including those we left behind. Their faith has been strengthened by it. I tell you what, I'm so thankful for this church, for my kids, not because I'm the pastor, not because of the weekend services. I mean, we partner with them, but I'm so glad my kids get to see what they read in the Bible happening in our everyday lives. 
And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They get to see their mom and dad outside of our responsibilities on staff at this church, just in our own Christian faith, lead people to Christ. They get to see that all the time. And I think that's such a reinforce. They see it, they read it, and they're like, oh yeah, we watched that happen. This is just, this is, they're following Christ, right? I want that for you guys. So I want to ask you, in regard to this whole thing, where are you at? And years ago, my daughter got stuck in that tree. And I think there's a lot of us, we are stuck tangled up in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're not able to handle it. We're hurting others and hurting ourselves. We're not called to, to hate on evil or ignore evil. We're called to redeem it. And that requires stepping through the gray, navigating carefully through the branches. I wanna ask you a critical and insightful question. Even if you're not a Christian, I think this question is gonna be helpful. When has God last redeemed evil through your life? through the story of your life. I mean, when have you actually persuaded somebody to change from evil? I think it's a critical question. I mean, you know, so we want to take a stand. Look, is the goal to take a stand or is, it, is the goal to change the world? The goal is to change the world. And if the answer to this question is, you know, it, it never really happens or not for a long time, we have a problem. We have a problem. We're in a collapsing culture because people have forgotten that subtle art of managing a knowledge of good and evil in a way that is captivating, winsome, persuasive, and most importantly, life-changing. Anybody can look at black and white and say, that's good and that's bad and you're bad and you need to be good. That's easy, right? But being like Christ and redeeming it, that's a challenge. I know it's simple, but I'm looking at our society and I think our church is already better than we think we are at this, but I wanna challenge you to say, look, I want God to use my life to redeem, to redeem. I want to be winsome and captivating like Jesus was. Like that's how I want to live. And right now, I know this message is probably convicting for a lot of us, like all across the spectrum. We're convicted. It's like, man, yeah, no, I am not. I'm not life-changing like Jesus was, and yet I'm called to be like Christ. Right now, I bet God is bringing some conversations to your mind that you've had with others. And I want you to just start praying, God, would you allow me to connect with them? I'm going to leave the patterns of my regular life. I'm going to leave the 99 of my regular life. And when the time's right, God, would you open my eyes to see when to have a conversation with this person. My hope is, you know, as you guys are having, you know, your, your, your Sunday brunch, your Sunday lunch, I'm hoping you're gonna sit down and say, hey, these, this, this is the person I'm praying for. You know, we've got this great series coming up, Parenting on Purpose or whatever it is. I am going to engage with them and I wanna start changing the world one life at a time. As we close, I wanna invite you to stand to your feet and uh, I'd like to just have a prayer for our churches. Lord God, I thank you for the way that you connected with the heart and then called us to life change. I thank you that you care enough about us to know us. I thank you for your vision, your wisdom, your discernment, and your insight to navigate that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Lord, we can't do it on our own. We need your Holy Spirit in us to navigate through that tree. And I just ask that your Holy Spirit would fall afresh on our church, giving us eyes to see how you change the world through us. Would you make us a church of winsome, captivating life changers who make the world better because of your grace and truth lived out through our lives. Lord, we just lift up names that you brought to our hearts to you right now, Lord. Right now, we just give you those names. God, would you give us a chance to leave the 99, connect with the one, and bring them back to you. It's in your name we pray, amen.